and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about Burt Reynolds. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hello. How are you? All right, how are you? Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. Good. So this week we've been reading the autobiography of Burt Reynolds. Famous mustachioed man. Yeah. It's an odd autobiography in that he talks about other people a lot. He does. But enough about me, it's called. I, yeah. I think it's a real ode to the people he's met that he admires. It's like a love letter to a lot of people, isn't it? It is. And I kind of, when I first realised that the book was going in that direction where he was actually talking about other people more than himself, I was a bit like, oh, no, are we even going to get an episode out of this? But it's actually interesting how much he reveals about himself yeah. by talking about other people. I think so. I almost think it's like he's a supporting man. He's literally supported many older legends that he admires so much, and that's who he is, because they've been a huge part of his life. The people he admires are his friends. And also, you think of a man as handsome and successful and masculine as Burt Reynolds actually might be a bit full of himself and just write a book all about himself. And that fact that he's chosen his autobiography to write about loads of other people. Yeah, and pick them up. Yeah, it really, I found it surprising, but yeah. I ended up loving it. Yeah, me too. I, I I really like this man. He's really he comes across as a very lovely person. So, were you a Burt Reynolds fan before you read this book? Well, I don't know much about him. I think he's got a bit of a cheesy image, and now I find out it's because he did one misjudged photo shoot. So <laughs> I feel like a lot of women had that very picture at their desk, like him reclining in under pants and a moustache and that sort of thing. <laughs> it didn't even become a bit of a, a sort of cheesy macho man. Sort of playboy man, which is why he got cast in uh, as Dirk Diggler in Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights, which is really the main thing I remember him as. And then before that, he's probably the best little whorehouse in Texas. How about you? Or oh, the Smokey and the Bandit, Cannibal Run, all of those. He was just yeah, he's like around, isn't he? really cool when I was a kid. Oh, was he? Yeah, because it was all like convoy and trucking and stuff. And yeah. that was such a cool little moment of pop culture, I which I loved. Him. And he was kind of like the guy in that. Yeah. He was like the hero. So he's always been very cool to me. And then he seemingly dropped right off the radar for a long time. And then, yeah, then he kind of had this resurgence with Boogie Nights, which kind of really didn't lead to other more high-profile films. So I guess I'm very aware of Burt Reynolds and like him a lot, but I don't really know anything he's done over the last 30 years until no. I read this book. Yeah, I'm going to confess this. What's the fellow who was in Friends with the Moustache? Tom Selleck. Tom Selleck. I think I get them confused a Okay, bit. I yeah. can see why you would do yeah. that. I guess Tom Selleck kind of came along as the next mustachio, gorgeous yeah. bloke after Burt Reynolds. I think Burt Reynolds was film and Tom Selleck was TV. He did a lot of TV, though, Burt Reynolds. He did, actually. He did loads, more yeah. than I knew. But we didn't really get them over here. Did, didn't see any of this. I would, because I'm so retro, I would love to watch Riverboat. I'd love to watch some of these TV shows he talks about. Did he not guest on Murder, She Wrote? Not that I recall. Well, then he didn't, because you wouldn't know I if would, he did. I, I would, actually. I would. Yeah, no. Oh, and of course, Deliverance. Iconic film. I've never seen it. Oh, watch it tonight. Well, I read the synopsis because of this. I googled it and I thought, bloody hell, this is cutting edge. This is before its time, before it was obviously the first of its time. First of its kind <laughs> in a time. It was a groundbreaking film. That's the one. The time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we can talk about yes. Deliverance at the, when we get to it. Yeah. So should we just get on with it? Yes. Burt Reynolds was his name, but it was also his dad's name. So when little Burt Reynolds was growing up, he was known as Buddy. Yeah, and he called his dad Big Burt. Big Burt. He calls him a lot in this book, Big Burt. Big Burt. Big Bird. Not Big Bird. Not Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that Big Bird, you know the space shuttle that blew up? Yeah. Did you know that Big Bird was supposed to go on it? No. So it was supposed to be some kind of children's program crossover and they were going to have Big Bird, the man in the costume, going on to the space shuttle. For some reason, at the last minute, they pulled that from happening. But Big Bird very nearly got blown up on the space shuttle. Good grief. I know. Anyway, that's not oh. Burt Reynolds' dad. No. It was not Big Bird. He was Big Bird. Yes, he was. And he was a war hero. I mean, he was at war and probably had some hideous experiences. Is course, that is what that yeah. means. Yeah. 
But he was away, basically, when... but So they lived in Michigan. Yeah, his parents were born on farms in North Michigan and they were married for 65 years and he never even heard them argue. They had his sister Nancy Ann at 1930. He was born in 1936. And then he moved to Florida when he came back from the war. So he joined the war in 1942 when little Bert was only six. And he was in Normandy and the Battle of the Bulge. So he yeah, was really right in, in the heart of some hideous, hideous war stuff. And he came back with medals. But he actually chose to stay on in Japan, to oh, occupy yeah. Japan for three more years mm. after the war. It's an interesting choice when you've got little kids at home. Yeah, and the war is essentially over. Yeah, I wonder if he sort of decompressed in that three years. Or maybe it was just a well-paid job. Maybe. I mean, you think after the war, it takes a while for society to get back. You don't just come back and go into the job you had before the war. Perhaps it was just a genuine occupation that you had to do at the end of the war until the country got going again. Yeah, actually, maybe Maybe. it's part of your sign-up. Or maybe they were just occupying Japan and needed people to do it. Well, that would be the case, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, he says when he came back, he looked great. And he gave his little son a handshake and a ten dollar note. And said, "Go and buy yourself something." Well, I shag your mum. Yeah, that's basically what he did. Snogged his mum, and they disappeared into the bedroom. And that was his dad returning, and he was twelve. He'd not seen his dad for six years. And he said it was seeing his dad in his uniform, six foot two, and he was just like, "Wow, that's a real man." It's a lot to live up to for a twelve-year-old yeah, boy. That's right, especially a dad who never tells you. They respect your choices or admire you or pat you on the back for anything. It, well, it's not, well, it's not a bad thing. In a way, I've started to think this is how you make your kid make something of himself. <laughs> Never say you're doing well because then you'll work harder and harder your whole life being a little bit screwed up, but achieve something. You have to work so hard to make your parents proud because they never say they are. I think it's a generational thing as well. I think this is 1940s, 1950s. I don't think you did used to say things like that to your kids, did you? Maybe some people did and some didn't. It was a very disciplinarian childhood. There's a lot of whippings. But he actually says he thinks it saved him. He would have been a wayward boy. Well, he was a naughty boy. Mm. He didn't have his dad there for That's true. six months. And he says his mum was lovely and she loved him. But he got together with the other local boys and they would run riot and get into scrapes and stuff. And actually, his dad did go into construction when he first got to Florida. But he actually ended up becoming chief of police. And so by the time Bert was 15, 16, and he would get into trouble, his dad is like the policeman. But at one point, they all were arrested and thrown in the cell. Yeah. And Bert says he can remember that all of his other friends' dads came to pick them up. Bert's dad came. Yeah, he worked there. And said to him, your dad's not coming to pick you up. That's right. And so he kept him in the cell for two nights yeah. with all the drunks and the criminals. And he said that really sorted him out and put yeah. him on the straight and narrow. Yeah. It's good parenting. Yeah, it is, <laughs> Terrify it? your child. Well, yeah, he obviously really needed it and he knew it. It's some tough love going on yeah, there. Yeah, definitely <laughs> tough love. Yeah, but he ended up being a tough man. Actually, emotionally, he isn't a tough man. Physically, he is. Yeah, he. it's an interesting mix of... I think the exterior of his dad, Burt Reynolds, is very much a man's man, star athlete. But at the same time, he seems to have the emotional side of his mum, where he is really considerate. I mean, he does say at that point where he's massively famous and the biggest box office star in the country, he said, if you met me at that time, I probably wasn't very nice. But I think by and large, when he's a kid and he's growing up and he's becoming an actor, he sounds like a really decent chap in this book that yeah, he, he wrote does. himself. Yeah, I know, but it usually comes through when they're yeah. not. Oh, no, I really like him. Yeah, I Because do. well, I don't always like the people we No, you read. don't. Yeah, but I no, like I, Burt Reynolds. No, I don't. I was going to say his dad thought that acting was a candy-ass job. For sissies. Yeah. Yeah. But I actually uh, like the phrase candy-ass. Candy-ass. I've never heard it, <laughs> knowingly. It's good, isn't it? That's a candy-ass job. Yeah, I mean, his dad, did he work up to general in the army, I think? And then he became chief of police. I'm sure in 1950s Florida, it's probably a bit embarrassing for that man to have an actor for a song, Actually, actually. yeah. Yeah, because Bert said years later, he went to hang out with his dad's colleagues. And he said, does my dad ever talk about me? You know, you often find out, oh, yeah, he's so proud of you. They said, no, he never mentions you. (laughs) 
That's how. Yeah, yeah, it is. But Bert isn't this quiet, creative boy. He is actually a tearaway star athlete, yes. isn't he? So yeah. his dad is proud of that. It's just I'm when sure. he decides that he wants to be an actor, his dad's not in with that. No. There's not some massive conflict between father and son at this point. No, there isn't. In fact, there never is. It's just that he never said he was proud, but he did before he died. Yeah. It doesn't seem that conflicted. I think he was a good dad. There's lots of pictures in the book of him with his dad on the yeah. set, and, yeah. you know, they seem to have a good... But Bert is a real lively young man, and one day there was a guy, the top athlete at school, they named him Flash because he was so fast at running, but Bert was really athletic. And so he challenged him to a race. Bert had no shoes. He run barefoot. And Flash, because he was good at running, had brand new spikes. And Bert challenged him to a race and outran him in bare feet, which then led him to being asked to be on the school football team. And he quite quickly becomes a star football player, which, of course, is good currency in the American educational system because you can get scholarships to universities if you're that good on the team. So people from universities come to, like, the colleges to watch the games and see who's really good at football. And so I think it was about three or four universities came to Burt because they wanted him on their football team, offering him scholarships. I think it was Florida State University who basically said to him, the ratio of girls to men at this college is seven to one. And so Bert thought, OK, I'll go there then. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, already a hit with the girls. He was. And he had one, he talks about his first love. And then his second love was a rich girl. Betty who, Lou. Yeah. Mm. Their parents didn't think he was good enough for her at all. And they just went about shagging everywhere. Apparently. Well, they asked him to use the back entrance. Wonder when he visited the house. <laughs> when he so visited the house. <laughs> when he visited the house. <laughs> oh my god, no. Well if he had used the back entrance, she wouldn't have had to go to Cuba for an abortion, yeah. would she? <laughs> Perhaps that's what he meant then. When he said the mum said, Can you use the back entrance next time? Uh yes, yeah, he got her pregnant. Oh they god. they were only sixteen. Yeah, parents took her to Cuba for an abortion. And he said when she got back to school, they just used to pass each other in the corridor and say hello. That was very awkward. But then he talks about this uh, documentary that came to Florida years later when he was famous and they found her and questioned her and all she did was talk about how they were up against that wall there and they were up against that tree. So she obviously thought of it as good times. She says she lost her virginity five minutes after meeting Burt Reynolds. Yeah, right. He was in there. Yeah, he was a real strapping, handsome young man. He's so handsome. Yeah. I do. I think this is another one of those stories where when he becomes an actor and he starts getting parts, they say, okay, you're a good actor, but you're really, really handsome. And that actually goes a very long way. Yes. So he talks about how Mae West saw Clark Gable on the lot. Clark, um, what's his name? That was uh, Kerry Grant. Who is that man? I want him in my next picture. He hadn't even yeah. spoken. That's how Kerry Grant got a job. Mae West just seeing him visually. That so. happened to Demi Moore as well. I mean, she was in. Oh, the, that's true. She was in the building for an audition, but not for St Elmo's Fire. And the director saw that's this right. woman walk down the corridor and said, "Oh, can you come and audition for my film?" And gave her the part yeah. purely based on the way she looked. Yeah. Right place, right face. So he's a football player, a very good one. But, of course, he doesn't become a football player, which he could have He done. would have been one, wouldn't he? He'd have been yeah. famous because his best mate was Dick Hauser, who became a legend in baseball and managed the Yankees for a while. So, I mean, all of his mates, he doesn't have any boring mates, does he? Every, everybody's someone. Well... Even from school on, though. If he had boring mates, he wouldn't write about them. That's book, true, that's true. So it looks like he's going to be a famous athlete, mm. but his knee is... Pops. Yeah, so what? it pops in a game, then he sits on the sideline, they patch it up, and he says, let me go back on, let me go back on, it's nothing, but he's back on the field, and within a minute it pops again. He's taken for surgery, and it turns out the ligament in his knee is just all like ground beef. Yeah. So it's not a strong knee anymore. No. And then he really screws himself over by crashing his dad's Buick. Right, he borrowed his dad's Buick. It hurts me that it's a Buick because they're beautiful cars. And this is the 50s as well. Imagine yeah. what that looks like. I can picture it. 
And then he got a ticket for speeding, which is already really bad. But because of that ticket, he slowed down. So when he got to nearly home, he turned the corner and there was a cement truck and he smashed into it. He actually went under it, I think. And then the cement blocks fell on top of the car and him and trapped him in there. He said he had like a split second where he saw the blocks falling. So he kind of curled himself up into the fetal position. Yeah, which didn't stop him from dashboard. being hurt, no. but it stopped w- him from being killed. He would have died if he hadn't done or that. Or lost his legs or yeah. something. Yeah. So he was crushed by the cement. They had to prise him out of there. And uh, he lost his spleen and he mm. actually flatlined at some point. It's incredible he survived that. Yes. And there's no more football after that. Couldn't play football no after way. that. Yeah. Damn it. But yeah, if he hadn't have got that ticket... He'd have been going so much faster that he would have 100% definitely died. None of us would have known who he was. No, there'd be no Burt Reynolds story. (laughs) (laughs) Because he had a scholarship, they said to him, we're not going to take that away from you. You can come back and we'll just put you to work in the dressing rooms and stuff. And he was just like, I don't really, you know, it's such a depressing thought after being a star athlete to be picking up towels and stuff. So he dropped out and he went to Palm Beach Junior College. And because his dad was a cop, he thought that he would be involved in law in some way. And he thought he would train to become a parole officer. But part of that college education, he had to take English literature. And that's when a teacher changed his life. Professor Watson Duncan. You'd think he'd be called Duncan Watson. Why? Because Watson's a surname and Duncan's a first name. Yeah, this is America with the boy's name. <laughs> boy's named Sue, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm surprised he's not called Marjorie. <laughs> anyway, Duncan Watson. No, Watson Duncan. Yeah. Watson Duncan. And he is bringing Shakespeare to life. Yes. And he uh, says to Buddy, Buddy Bert, you're going to be an actor. He says, am I? Yes, you, you yes. are, he says. Yes, you are. <laughs> Do you know, in these books, we read a lot. I mean, it's not even just in these books. Quite a lot of people say, that teacher That's changed right. my life. Did a teacher change your life? No. 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 I really thought about this this week because mm. I thought, oh, my God, I hear so many people saying the yeah. teacher changed life. All my teachers were crap. There's not, I can't imagine them changing anybody's no, life. we had to change their own lives, didn't we? Yeah. They all seemed begrudged to be there. Mm. Mediocre. That's why I have a mediocre life. (laughs) Bloody English education system. (laughs) But they're gems, those teachers. They're not common, those teachers that change lives. Oh, yeah, okay. They're golden. Then they do a play at the school and they give Bert the lead role because he's really handsome, right? I don't think? think it's because he's the best person for the part. In that class, there's probably six or seven young men who fulfill that requirement oh, who can you... speak really well and learn lines it's because of the way he looks he's a leading man right? yeah right and there's so few men doing drama I'm not taking anything away from him but I don't think he's some ingenue I think he's just really handsome at this point I can't tell you because you've seen more of his films than me but he does say that because of his looks he always gets these parts that don't showcase his actual acting yeah. talents enough yeah. so who are we to say Anyway, well, but he won a scholarship from that. The Florida State Drama Award. So he must have been Award. quite good. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Or they just thought he's really good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give him an award. Yeah. I think at the age of 17, if he's got the lead in a play and you were in charge of the scholarship or whatever, you might say, OK, this guy's got potential. Yeah. But you read this book, right? This is an actor. His character is an actor. Oh. He's so emotionally open. He's an actor. He will have been good. The one thing I've learned from this book, actually, because I only really have known him from Smokey and the Bandit and the Cannonball Run, etc., is how much of an actor this man is. Because you do not get that from those films. Right, exactly. And we'll get into that. He would have probably been good. All right. He pulled his heart out. He would have given it his all. So he gets the scholarship to go to the Hyde Park Playhouse in New York, which is a summer stock. Yeah. And he's in a barn. And he's also there with Joanne Woodward. Yeah, who he has a massive crush on. And she says, come and hang out with me and my boyfriend. And he goes there thinking, oh, well, I'll get rid of this boyfriend because I fancy Joanne. And then he gets there and he falls in love with the boyfriend because he has the prettiest blue eyes he's ever seen. And it's Paul Newman. Yeah, yeah. Also as a teenager. He's like, wow, your boyfriend's beautiful. <laughs> and she said, oh, what did you think of my boyfriend last night? He went, I think I'm in love with him. 
I do think that Paul Newman is perhaps the most handsome man who ever lived. Do yeah, but amazing that they're all there together. Yeah, it's and cool, they're not isn't even it? successful actors yet. They're just kids in a summer stock. Summer stock in a barn. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So he then stays in New York, right? Oh, I love it when he says Elvis came to town for his oh, opening yeah. of his first ever movie, Love Me Tender. And he said a mutual friend knew Elvis, so they played poker the day before together. And he remembers him saying to his sort of assistant man, when's the new cries are coming out? And he says, oh, tomorrow. He says, hey, oh, here's some cash, go and get me one. Wow. And imagine how much cash. <laughs> and he says, oh, sure, do you, any, any particular colour? He's like, I don't care, man. I imagine him <laughs> saying, like that. I don't care, man. So teenage Burt Reynolds is already in New York playing cards with Elvis. Yes. Wow. I know, he's so well connected sort of all the time. Everyone wants him in their gang. Yeah, because he's good looking. <laughs> <laughs> It's not just face, it's his body. You see him, he's, yeah. he's about 6'4 or something. Yeah. He looks it anyway. Yeah, so he's hanging out and he also gets invited to this party oh, race. Oh, P.S., I've got to not be that shallow. He might have a really winning personality. Oh, I'm Let's sure guess he's, that he yeah. does. No, and he's completely charming. <laughs> yes. and he's got it all. We're so shallow. He's got it all. This is terrible, treating him like a piece of meat. <laughs> Yeah, he went to another party and this beautiful woman is there and she's got a see-through shirt and he fixated on this see-through shirt. And she's also really funny. She laughs at all his jokes and she makes him laugh too. He can't believe it. They're getting on so well. And then she says, come back to mine. And he's like, no, no, uh, I'll I'll walk myself home or something. He gets out of it anyway. And then the next day they said, did you turn down Greta Garbo? (laughs) Yeah. He said, that that was Greta Garbo. I didn't know that. And he said, yeah, because you never looked at her face. <laughs> <laughs> then he makes Rip Torn. That's what I mean. It's name after name, isn't it? Yeah, well, he's hanging out in places. I think he says there's a couple of coffee shops and stuff where the other actors hang out. And Burt Reynolds is not in with all of the... He's still on the periphery a bit. And there's this other young actor in there who's also hanging out on his own. He starts talking to him, and it turns out it is Rip Torn, who's not yet a successful actor. Do you know what? I know his name, but I didn't know who he was, and I looked him up. I don't even know his face either. He's just got such a great name. It's a stupid name. Well, it's memorable, isn't it? (laughs) Well, you didn't know who he was. I didn't. So how memorable is it? (laughs) It can't be his real name, can it? Do you think he had parents, Mr. and Mrs. Torn? Yeah, and, they're like, and they what just we nicknamed him Rip. Rip. Oh, it could be a nickname. nickname. Yeah. By the way, Burt Reynolds is still Buddy Reynolds at this point. Yeah. And then his agent says to him, you can't call yourself Buddy because you're 23. Patrick Swayze was Buddy his entire life as well. They called him Buddy. Buddy. Was Patrick Swayze's dad called Patrick Swayze Sr.? I can't remember. I think it's an American thing to name the son after the dad and then call them Buddy or Junior. Right. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, they advised Buddy Reynolds to change his name to Bert because Buddy is perceived as a childish name. It's just a nickname, isn't it? Bert's his actual name, so... I mean. So he's with Rip Torn. The actor's studio was like the massive thing in New York at this time, but Bert Reynolds wasn't confident enough to approach it to see if he could get classes. He just didn't think he was good enough. But he said to Rip Torn, you should go and audition for Lee Strasberg and Nelia... Kazan and he does but he thinks he's flunked it so he storms out and then they say to Burt Reynolds we love him go and get him back so Burt Reynolds runs after him and Rip Torn's like oh my god I can't believe I fucked it up at the action he said no come back come back and then they offer Rip Torn a place and Rip Torn says I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for little buddy Burt here so give him a place as well and they did Yep. So Burt Reynolds got into the actor's studio, but he quite quickly realised it wasn't the place for him. He wasn't enjoying it. So he left the actor's mm. studio, but he continued acting training. He got himself an acting teacher that he got on with yeah. and continued his like, acting like lessons. Like a therapist, really. Some work for you, yeah, some definitely. don't. And all of this is educating me into the fact that Burt Reynolds is a proper actor who really put the work in. Yeah. Because you think people like Burt Reynolds who took those roles. You think, oh, he used to be a football player who now is an actor because he already has fame as a football player or something. Actually, Burt Reynolds was always a proper bona fide actor. True. He said in 1961 he got a part in a play as a sailor. And when he looked into the audience, to his horror, he saw 
Tennessee Williams, Natalie Wood, Elia Kazan and Warren Beatty. <laughs> and he totally forgot his lines. <laughs> it's the beginning of the second half. <laughs> he just totally freaked out. So he started laughing and he carried on laughing because he still couldn't remember his lines. And he laughed and laughed for ages until his lines came back to him. And then afterwards, they all came and said, you were so brave to laugh for that long, to keep that going for that long. It was so brave. And Tennessee Williams said, I want to write a play for you. You're yes. amazing. <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? It's brilliant. Yeah. But anyway, that play ran for three days. Yeah. So... But, but then, you yeah. see, he does, again, with this autobiography, because he talks a lot about other people, he does jump around in his life yeah. a lot. Because the next thing he says after being in this play, which closed for three days, is that Universal signed him to a seven-year contract. That's right. I want to know how that came yeah, about. Yeah, but he didn't but tell us. We don't know. No, maybe they came in that first three days. And saw him forgetting his lines, yeah. but laughing. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Seven-year contract, and the first thing they signed him up for was Riverboat, which was a series, which he said was terrible. I really want to watch it. He says it's one of the worst shows on TV, but it was massive. It is really popular. Mm. Anyway, he got really sick of it to the point where he threatened if they didn't let him out of his contract, he would blow up the boat. And they looked at him and thought, he means it. Yes. So they let him out <laughs> <laughs> but because he was on that, they didn't use him a lot as well. I think his character was kind of a bit boring to him. So a lot of the time he'd have to be on set, yeah. but he wasn't being used. So he would just go wandering off. And because he was there a lot, he got to know the other stage managers and stuff. And they'd let him go into other studios while other things were being filmed. And he would get to see Spencer Tracy. Yeah, who was his idol. And so like young Burt Reynolds. Then it's just like running after Spencer Tracy because saying, oh, my God, I, I love you. Do you have any advice for me? And, so, and Spencer Tracy says, come in and he's sitting down yeah. in Spencer Tracy's dressing room and, and just has this one-on-one -on -one audience with this amazing actor and he's learning stuff. Yeah, and he him. got the best advice that he refers to all through this book and he obviously, it is really great. And it is, uh, yeah, acting is the best job in the world as long as no one catches you doing it. I love that. I know. I was actually watching a film last night and I went, I can see you acting. Yeah. It was Christian Bale in that Ford and Ferrari. Yeah. He's doing a terrible, terrible job in that film. I was like, I can see you acting. I can see it. You should never, ever see someone acting. Yeah. Brilliant. And then he bloody became friends with Betty Davis and he talks for ages in this book about her and you think yeah. oh maybe you should stop now no you shouldn't it's so interesting yeah not everybody gets to be that close to yeah. her yeah and of course it's all complimentary he absolutely loves it he says I know she can be awful to some people but she's always awful to the people in charge she's never awful to the little people or the crew and everybody she'll support mm. all the underdogs we've heard this before yeah. this is my favourite thing here is <laughs> Joan Crawford dies oh. and he talks about how real their hatred was and some reasons for it. And the day she died, he was at a party and he's talking to a reporter and she walked into the room, beeline straight over to him and said, well, the cunt died today. <laughs> and he, this horrified, goes, oh, Betty, this is a such and such. He's a reporter for so and so. And she goes, but she was always on time. <laughs> <laughs> That's I love it. Genius. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but Brilliant. I didn't realise that the hatred between Bet and Joan kind of stemmed from a bloke. Yeah, she said it was Francho. Francho Tone? Have you ever heard of him? No. <laughs> Franchot Tone. I did actually totally mean to Google him. Did he marry Joan Crawford? Yeah. Because they were engaged. They, oh, OK. Well, they were engaged, but Betty was completely in love with him. Yeah. But after Joan was engaged to yeah, him... Yeah, it does seem like they did a film and Joan was already engaged to him. Yeah, it's not says, like Joan stole him he from Betty. took him from me, was her words. I don't buy it, to be honest. I think that's just a reason to hate on yeah, Joan. Yeah, so they had rivalry in films and love. I kind of also a couple of things that Bert said here made me feel that Joan was quite fragile and vulnerable and actually Betty Davis was a bit of a unrelenting steamroller and her. that she Joan Crawford was always acting like she was a star and we know that she actually let herself believe in this Hollywood legend stuff whereas Betty Davis didn't she was actually really down to earth yeah and, and knew she was a worker and a trooper the Errol Flynn stuff as well. Oh, yeah. How much she hated him. Yeah. But then she said she came to admire him and then she turned down another film because he was going to be in it. So it's a bit conflicting. Well, it was yeah. Gone with the Wind. 
at that That's time, right, they offered to go on with the win to Betty Davis, but at the time, the Clark Gable role was assigned to Errol Flynn, so she wouldn't do it. Yep. And then by the time it came round, actually, Errol Flynn wasn't in it, and it was too late for yes. Betty. But if you read Catherine Hepburn's autobiography, which we have, yes. it says that she actually was contracted with the studio to be Scarlett O'Hara to the point where right until the day of filming, right. she had all the costumes measured and everything. She didn't want to do it, but she, she was forced into it and then at the last minute they decided to go with an unknown actress Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee. so why so it must have been a different part oh no do things. you know what Gone with the Wind was such a massive deal it was probably years in the making oh yeah that's true and so by the time Catherine Hepburn right. was they probably had already done the Betty Davis yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's very, very entertaining, his stories in this book. All of them. Let's just say that. Brilliant. Are we to take from this that Burt Reynolds, young Burt Reynolds, had a romantic liaison with Betty Davis? No, he... he well, that's not what I took from it. I took that he escorted her a lot of places and he just loved being around her and hearing stories. You would. He never just... says anything remotely that makes you think they were having sex. No, and then obviously some years later when he has a long-time affair with Dinah Shaw. She was 20 years older than him, so he doesn't have a problem going out with women a lot older than well, him. Well, but... the woman who took his virginity owned the antique shop. She was older. Oh, yeah, that's true. All those years ago in Florida, he, he was looking in the window of an antique shop and then the woman come out, and that was the first woman he slept with was older. Right. And throughout his life, Mae West, I took from this that they he doesn't say as much, but the way he wrote about Mae West... I got that he would only really go to her flat. And he said, I went there a number of times. I took that that meant that they were having sex. Oh, I mean... Whereas with Betty Davis, I don't get that. OK, I mean, who knows? He might have been a young stud, he might not, but... I can't I, I, imagine I, Betty Davis would have a young Burt Reynolds in her house and not try no. and shag him. Well, I don't know. From what, her book, it doesn't seem she's as promiscuous. She falls in love with people. Mm. And has lots of large gaps between, as opposed to Joan Crawford, who was like a robot weird machine woman who just stripped for anyone sort of thing. Quite different. No, I I actually really took that as a really respectful friendship. Yeah, no, I did as well. And just because they have sex doesn't mean it can't be a respectful friendship. That's true. Yeah, but we're just making that bit up. (laughs) He doesn't say that. I can't tell you, I love how petty it is between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford to the point that when... Joan Crawford married the guy who run Pepsi yeah. and had a Pepsi machine installed on set. Betty Davis got a Coke machine installed. <laughs> <laughs> I love the rivalry. I love it. It's so funny. He also says in this book that that scene and whatever happened to Baby Jane, where Betty Davis kicks Joan Crawford in the head, says so she actually did it. Yeah, Joan Crawford yeah. had to go to hospital for stitches. Yeah, OK, that's bad. And she also said Betty got them to get the biggest real dead rat like, <laughs> and switched it in in the last the, all the rehearsals they used a prop rat and then they switched it in with the real rat so when she uncovers her dinner Joan Crawford and sees this rat she screamed they said it wasn't acting it was real but it was yeah. Betty Davis that made it happen I, Betty Davis does sound like a massive bitch yeah well they both were pretty nasty to each other weren't oh they? yeah but I think that Betty Davis is stronger and I almost think to the point where Joan Crawford hang on we read Joan Crawford's oh. Daughter. Yeah, I don't have any sympathy for no. either of them. I, I almost did then. I almost had a bit of sympathy for Joan Crawford. You nearly did. Until you reminded me that we've read Mommy Dearest. She's an she's absolute a nightmare. monster. Yeah, an alcoholic right. nightmare. She got what she deserved. Yes. Good for Betty Davis. <laughs> then he's all over the place a bit in this book, but the next thing he talks about is Deliverance. Yes. Absolute iconic film. Yeah, which I obviously need to see, but I've read the synopsis now, so I know what happens. (laughs) It's interesting, the films that he's obviously proud of, he talks more at length, of course, in this book. And if you've seen the film and you love Deliverance, the chapter in this book where he talks about it, so like the flipping banjo playing kid, that's not his hand. (laughs) He's perfect, that kid. Really? Oh, yeah, he's sitting on the porch playing his banjo. That famous music, Dueling Banjos. Yes. And then it's, it kind of pricks a bubble in a way. Like, he says, don't let them catch you acting. Well, then don't tell the story in your autobiography that the kid couldn't play the banjo. So another kid who could play the banjo had to stick his hands through <laughs> under the kid. So it looked like he was playing the banjo. I mean, brilliant. That's really good. So you'll be aware of this toothless bloke. Well, the toothless bloke... For people who don't know Deliverance, it's about some corporate guys who kind of go into the lake that's going to be 
rate for commerce and industry. And it's all about the people who live in the backwaters. So for want of a better word, the hillbillies and the hicks. Yeah, so the city types go on a sort of outdoor river adventure and they encounter the actual the real locals. people who live there. Yeah. Right, two bones to pick with Burt Reynolds. Yeah. It's because this book is about largely about other people. But he says when they're trying to find the actor to play an authentic backwater redneck, they can't find anybody with teeth missing. Yeah. And then Burt Reynolds says, oh, I know this guy called Cowboy, Herbert Cowboy Conrad. I know him because I was a stuntman at Ghost Town in the Sky, which is a Wild West theme park where I was like... How can you be a stuntman in a Wild West theme park and, and not tell it. us about it? That's right. Oh, man. I know. I read that sentence. I was like, but no, we want to yeah, find yeah. about the Wild West. What a laugh he yeah, must have had. Yeah. And we don't even know. No, I know. I mean, he's dropped it in there, obviously. But yeah. yeah. So they get this guy. And because he's working at a Wild West theme park, I'm kind of thinking, oh, he's an actor stuntman no. too. He just doesn't have any teeth. No, actually, he... He's his proper hillbilly. He's hired at the Wild West theme yeah. park because he's an authentic hillbilly. Oh, my God, the most worrying thing, they say, because there's a male rape in this film. <laughs> oh, my God. And they really... said to him, will you be comfortable in this male rape scene? And he says, well, I've done a lot worse than that in my time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, carry on. But he also said that some of those, because he couldn't read the script, Burt Reynolds will go through the script and tell him his lines and stuff. But he also said that he would have trouble remembering them. And he also had a stutter. So actually the lines would come out completely differently. But they end up in the film and you think, oh my God, that's actually coming from him. Yeah, when when he describes what he does say, it sounds much more colloquial. That's how you would speak. So it's really, really authentic. The really famous lines like, squeal like a pig boy. And oh, he got really that. Pe- yeah, it's very worrying. Like, <laughs> it's, very, it's very worrying. But is that why it's so realistic? Do you think? Yeah, because they got someone yeah, so course. real for that yeah. job. Wow, I've never seen it. Obviously, so did that blow your mind reading this? Yeah, thing? of course. You just think, oh, these are all middle class actors. And right. they, they're just really good at reading. They're just not going to take that for a bit and then put them back in after. <laughs> <laughs> So Deliverance is filmed in the river and they can't even use canoes because the river is so treacherous and stuff. They're using kayaks and it's, you know, an average person can't do that. They have to be trained and stuff. And it turns out that Deliverance was filmed in sequence because most films are filmed obviously out of sequence. And when they said to the director, this is really unusual. Why are we filming it in sequence? He says, well, it's in case one of you drowns. Yeah. And then they just have to change the plot. (laughs) They'd have to write it into the script. Yeah. Wow. I know, that's bloody scary, isn't it? But the funniest story from Deliverance is when, because obviously the whole thing is treacherous and they are in waterfalls and raging yeah. rapids and stuff. There's a bit where Burt Reynolds has to go over the falls in his canoe and obviously they won't let him do it. So they do it with a dummy. And so they send a dummy over the waterfall in the canoe and Burt Reynolds is watching. He goes, that looks crap. We can't use it. Yeah. Please let me do it. And they said, there's no way you can go over the falls in a canoe. And he says, well, then I'm not doing the film because it looks utterly ridiculous it's so clearly a dummy eventually he talks them into them letting him go over the falls in a canoe and they can control they have control of the dam so they can control the flow of the water like a mile up so what they do they get him in position and then they open the dam and then Burt Reynolds says he was just ready to do it and all of a sudden there's this huge roar and before he knows it he pushes him over the falls he's right down under and he says his stuntman training one of the other stuntmen he worked with said to him if you ever do anything underwater don't fight the current go with it because if you follow the current it will spit you out and that's what he did and he hit his head on a rock anyway he's taken to hospital and the director comes to see if he's all right. And Bert Reynolds, all he's bothered about is what it looks like. <laughs> Bert Reynolds says to him, oh, so what did it look like? And he goes, you look like a dummy going yeah, over the yeah, waterfall. Yeah, exactly. I love that. They went to all that trouble and it looked as bad as the if dummy. If they didn't get a close-up, you'd kill him. <laughs> Bloody kill him. <laughs> oh, all right, so yeah, good if you've watching. watched Deliverance, this is golden to read. And if yeah. you haven't, it's, it's just really interesting and it makes you want to watch it. He actually says that Deliverance might not be his best acting, 
but it's the best film that he's been right. in. Right. And see, up until that point, he'd not really had a role like this, a proper acting role. And of course, we haven't mm. mentioned he's with John Voight. Oh, John Voight, his best friend for life after this. Who wrote the foreword of this book, actually. Yes. And Angelina Jolie's dad, right? Yeah, no, it's weird. It's only weird because she's just so stunning and he. Not. You can see her in him, though. <laughs> yeah, no, you yeah. can. But he's getting to be a proper actor and his performance is really good. And his agent is like, this is brilliant. This is actually now going to get your career where you want it to be because you're going to start getting offered roles. Oh, no. And then three months before it comes out, well, he's on a talk show, right? Well, yeah, but it's just this photo shoot, isn't it? And there's this woman on there who I think she works for Cosmopolitan magazine and she says to him, oh, you should come and be our centrefold. You know, nobody's done that before. What fun. And he, Burt Reynolds is like, he's a modern man. He's all for equality of the sexes and stuff. Oh, it would be really good fun if I went and did a naked centrefold shoot for Cosmopolitan magazine. Every single person he said this to said, don't do it. His agent said to him, please don't do it. You have no idea how this is going to affect your career. With Deliverance, you have changed your career. And when Deliverance comes out in three months time, people are going to view you differently. Please don't do this. And he did it. I mean, it's an amazing photo, I have to say. But it's the one that probably made it to all the magnets on fridges and people's yeah, it offices. Is, yeah. It's this, this one photo shoot that has never left him. He was the centrefold of Cosmopolitan magazine. One and a half million copies were printed and it sold out its print run. It was massive. He was everywhere. He was on T-shirts and fridge Yeah, magnets. they merched him to shit. Yes. <laughs> I've always been aware of this mm. photo because it I looks stunning. He looks great. This is the sad thing about it. It looks really good fun. He looks amazing. But just at that point in his career, all of a sudden, everything he'd worked so hard to get away yeah. from, he was just eye candy And it's again. The, the 70s, so it's like a real stud picture, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And do you know what? And what actually made me sad to read in this book is that he said, I'm still embarrassed today and I sorely regret doing yeah. it. Yeah. Wow. And then Deliverance came out and was a hit, but he actually thinks it would have been a bigger hit if he hadn't done that because he cheapened it, yeah. cheapened the film. Men can't go see a man's man film, especially when there's male rape in yeah. it. If one of the characters is, is looking like a playboy bunny girl. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> and also, I think, you know, he was possibly mooted for an Oscar. Yeah. But doing this photo shoot yeah. and stuff, of course, nobody took him seriously because again. Would it have seemed a bit gay. Would, it, would that have been the worry? That, um, would that have even entered into it? I don't know, actually. I'm not sure. Because, because it was for a woman's Because it's magazine. a dangerous topic. Mm -hmm. And if you're then flaunting your body in a way that men don't, yeah. he said it was the first time a man had ever done what women usually do. And it'd be a centrefold. Yeah. So anyway, it kind of... Do you know what? I kind of get it. It's just so much... It's it's fun. And I think Burt Reynolds is fun. And he likes to do fun yeah, things. And he's a practical joker. Knock on effect. Yeah. He had no idea. He had no idea. But, so it derailed his career. Yeah, and it, it knocked the film. Yeah. That's a real shame. Because that's an important film. It would be interesting to see how his acting career would yeah. have evolved had he not done it. So that's, a, that's the first thing to, for a man to do, and it was the first as a film to show male rape. Yeah. That needed to take precedence, didn't it, that film? Yeah. And then this could have happened any other time after that. Yes. But that still might have retrospectively derailed that film's importance. Oh, I, I think over the years, Deliverance has definitely stood the test of time. And, Do you? It, and it is the classic. And I think it is probably perceived with Boogie Nights as Burt Reynolds' Best defining work. role. Yeah. yeah. I don't think over the passage of time it's done damage Yeah, that's to good. It. And Dueling Banjos, the best theme tune ever. <laughs> Absolutely ever. Anyway, he met this uh, singer in Japan called Miko and he brought her back to America and she they was, lived together she for was, a few years. Yeah. And she ended up being one of the original cast of Star Trek. And he says that she learnt English because when they met, he couldn't speak Japanese and she couldn't speak English. Yeah. But he says communication wasn't a problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all right. But she learnt English through watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. And he said the first thing in English that she said to him was, what's up, Doc? <laughs> but they made it work for four years. Yeah. 
four years and actually I think they only split up because he was on Dinah Shaw's chat show and he said within two minutes I completely forgot we were on television there was so much spark between them and they'd arranged to spend the weekend at Palm Springs live on television even though he had a girlfriend obviously and so they kind of just got together from that he said it was instant yeah and what he did say which is a little bit embarrassing if you care about women at all, is it's the first time he's ever fancied somebody, basically, and respected them. Is that what he said? <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Love and respect. Imagine that. So, yeah, it was the massive love of his life. Well, it was the first massive love of he his life. He talks a lot about her. Yeah. She sounds pretty amazing, actually, because she never really crossed over to England, right? Really, I did look up her songs. I did know a lot of them. You do know them. It says that she broke down barriers on her show. She sang a duet with Nat King Cole. And it was the first time, it was 1961, it was the first time a white woman had sung with a black man on TV. And she was criticised so heavily for it. The next week she got Sidney Poitier on as a brilliant, guest. Brilliant, So she sounds like... Pretty cool yeah, lady. Yeah, really cool. She's best mates with Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, yeah. Because they ended up living together for some years and he said Ella was always round at their house and Mel Torme was a regular guest and Groucho Marx. I mean, she was really showbiz. Yeah, it's when you have a daytime chat show, you get to meet everyone. Yeah, I guess so you do, you, yeah. yeah. And he made a lot of friends from that. Like Fred Astaire. He met them through her and then kept them as friends. Yeah. And she is 20 years older than him. And you look at all the pictures of them together. She doesn't look it. She looks amazing. They look the same age. Maybe he looks a bit older than he is and she looks a bit younger. But they look great together. They really had true love. And the only reason they ended up parting after, what, about five years or so? Was because he realised he wanted kids and she was too old to have kids. And it absolutely broke his He broke his own heart leaving her. But do you know what? He did marry a woman called Judy Kahn. Yeah. only talks about briefly in this book and he doesn't talk about them getting married the relationship or anything but what he does say about her is that when he's asked to host the tonight show and he said i'll host it if my first guest can be judy khan and i thought why is that a thing and then i oh it's his wife yeah who he's been married to had an awful divorce from. yeah they might have two years 63 to 65 and that's spoken for years haven't yeah they? at all well he kind of says in this book it's because she was heavily into drugs and sex parties and he yeah. wasn't yeah and she said he was boring yeah well perhaps he's, he was. he's happy to say that yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and so they got her on it was the first Shut time they talked for ages yeah and he said to her, Cor, you look so good. And she said, so do you. And he said, why did we ever get divorced? And then she said, it's because I hear you're into older women. And the audience turned on her. Yeah, because they love Dinosaur. They love Dinosaur. And then Burt Reynolds said, but Judy, you're a really big fan of Dinosaur, aren't you? And she said, yeah, yeah, I am. I've got all of her records. And Burt Reynolds said, okay, let's go for a commercial break. But he actually yeah. saved yes. her. Yes. What an interesting guest to have. I know, have brave, for, yeah. slash mad. <laughs> so where, again, this book is a bit all over the place, but are we kind of at the end of the 1970s at this point? Yeah, we? yeah. He did Navajo Joe, where he plays a native. Because of his grandma, this is when he mentions it, being a Cherokee, he said he often plays those outsider roles. And he says that he always asked for better dialogue to make it a less of a stereotype mm-hmm. and that natives generally have thanked him. Over the years. So that's really good. Clint Eastwood's a really good mate. He's got so many interesting, great mates. He says about Clint Eastwood, he only says about nine words a year. <laughs> <laughs> he is laugh out loud funny, isn't he? Quite a lot. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get from the fact that they got him to host a Tonight Show. Yes. He's the first actor, the fact he is a funny man. Yes. And a lot of his films are comedy. I was Other than Deliverance, his biggest hits, they're kind of comedy yeah, films. Yeah, you're right, yeah. But he's not perceived as a comedy actor. He's not like a Jim Carrey or a Steve Martin. No. But he is just very funny. Also, I didn't know. I mean, I knew he was massive at the end of the 70s. I did not know that he was the number one box office actor Five years in a row, and nobody has done that since. Nor did I. That's an amazing... Not even Will Smith. Not even Will Smith, not even Tom Cruise. Bloody hell. Well, anyway, yeah, he hit the 1980s on a high, and then he got really ill with... Temporomandibular disorder. Oh, good, thanks for saying that. (laughs) (laughs) 
It's, it's jaw related, yeah. Yeah. That's all I. It sounds that's all I remember to say. Uh, mandib- your jaw bone is called your mandible, isn't it? I don't know. So tempero isn't tempero something to do with the upper part? Of the I skull? don't know. So he's got a temporal mandible. Yeah, he's got a temporal mandibular disorder. I don't know so how he... you remember that. <laughs> No, but it sounds awful. And it went on for years, right? To the point where he was just accept any treatment because nothing was solving it. Mm. But also he couldn't eat. So he lost a lot of weight. He lost a lot of weight and it was right at the beginning of AIDS, HIV and AIDS, and it was hitting the media. And so everybody just said he had AIDS. And that was the rumours that spread. And a lot of people dropped him. Friends yeah. dropped him because people didn't understand AIDS then and they thought you could get it just from being in the room with somebody and he got completely yeah. treated like a leper and he found out who his real friends were right then. Do you know the names of the people that he says stuck by him, I immediately love them all <laughs> because at that time it, there was a massive scare around yeah, HIV there really AIDS. was. People really did want to distance yes, they, themselves from everyone. Yes, but he didn't have it. No. <laughs> Even if he had it, that would be bad. But he didn't have he it didn't and nobody it. believed him. His yeah, but you know what? I him. bet the National Enquirer and all those tabloids. Oh, yeah. Play, I bet true. they were all saying he did. Yeah. So he got absolutely dropped from all work. Oh, yeah, it was a real down and out period. And that's where he disappeared to at that point. Mm-hmm. And he got hooked on the drugs. Painkiller. Yeah. yeah. He ended up having to go cold turkey and went into a coma to get off them. So it's really bad. He ended up having every single tooth realigned. Yeah, it just the whole it's thing is absolutely horrendous. Yeah. But I tell you what, Elizabeth Taylor reached out to him because obviously she has her AIDS foundation. Yeah. And she really helped him out, even though he didn't have HIV and AIDS. And then he repaid that by going and raising funds for her and turning yeah. up at her galas. And even then... The press and friends were turning against him. And he says, do you know what? I've done charity work for cancer and none of you had a problem with that. So why are you now having a problem with me doing charity work for HIV and AIDS? It's just a stigma attached to it all. Burt Reynolds is one of the good guys, isn't he? That's exactly the phrase I would use. He also says around this time that, because he's talking about the friends that he kept, are the stuntmen, the best friends of his life. Yes, there's real camaraderie there, isn't yeah, there? Yeah. Really... Because, again, because of the layout of this book, he talks about being a stuntman and being friends with one of the... Is it Hal Needham? Yes. Actually gets a whole a chapter of his own. But he yeah. doesn't really tell us about the beginnings of his stunt career. No, and that's he doesn't. what I would he love doesn't. to know. But then right at the end he does say, because I've done so many of my own stunts, I'm in agony all the time. <laughs> it's a little bit of a Jackie Chan about him. Yeah. In that he does a lot of his own stunts and then he also really... Really bonds with the similar people and understands them and pushes for them to get awards and you know yeah, wants he to be recognised. Really puts a good case forward about why there isn't like it's not recognised by the Oscars yeah. best stunt work. It's like when you think of that makeup, costume, yeah. lighting, everything else is. Yeah. Why the heck are these people literally risking their lives yeah. and for it's film? So skilled. Yeah. And the more you read about them, like Jackie Chan's the ultimate book about it, but the more you read, and this is there's a lot in this book, yeah. you really appreciate what well, they contribute. It's as important to the history of cinema as Fred Astaire's dancing. Yes. As Buzzaby Berkeley, yes. yeah, which are all recognised as part of the yeah. rich fabric of cinema, but somehow stunt work kind of yeah. isn't. But the stunt guy, Hal Needham, see, this is what I didn't know, is that he wrote Smokey and the Bandit. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. They were such good mates that he'd end up living in his pool cottage or something. And then one day he comes out and he says, look, I've written a screenplay, will you read it? He read it and thought, this is the worst screenplay I've ever read, but why not? Let's do it. It turns out to be Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. It's a legendary film. Oh, and he says you should direct it to the stuntman who's never directed in yeah. his life and it turns out to be great and he's directed loads more films after this. And he said, like, nobody, no studio... I guess it's because Burt Reynolds has the star power at this point. Mm. No studio would ever take on a film from an unproven stuntman who hadn't yeah. written a script or directed a film before. Good and it's great. And he gave him the leg up to get him yeah. going in a whole new career, which is brilliant. And Smoking... I didn't know that Smoking the Bandit was the first film to have a gag reel along with the credits at the end yeah, right. which has really become a thing yeah it really has yeah. yeah right weird alfred hitchcock said that smoking the bandit was his favorite film i didn't know that i would never have imagined <laughs> no, that. i did not know that but he always said burt reynolds talks about the snobbery around his films and thinks it's because they're southern so people right. think they're fluff hillbilly and, films yeah but um that year only star wars made more money 
Amazing. Because they released it in Radio City Music Hall first in New York and it didn't really do a thing. Stiff. And then when they released it down south, the queues went around the block and they, it was being played in five screen cinemas. It would be on every screen. And of is course, it? Sally Field is in it. Yes. I loved reading about her because I consider her a proper actor in the fact that she's been in some of the biggest films on earth and you still don't really know what she looks like. Or most people might not know that name, Sally Field, because mm. she hasn't let the whole celebrity thing take over her career. And actually, when they got her, Burt Reynolds wanted her for Smokey and the Bandit. And the studio was like, no, no, we don't want her. She's, I think she was on TV as the Flying Nun. Yeah, and they the was Flying like, Nun. <laughs> we don't know, we don't want her, we want Farrah Fawcett yeah. or somebody like that. And he said, no, I'm doing it with Sally Field. Proper actor. And said that when she first came on set, she got really annoyed with everyone because everyone was having a laugh and fluffing their lines or trying to make each other laugh. And she wasn't used to it at all because she was a proper actor. Took it very seriously. And said it took her a while to lighten up and Mm. get into their way of doing stuff. But he quite soon realised that he was falling for her, right? Yeah, I mean, a proper, proper love. This is the next biggest love of his life Uh, Sally Field is how long were they together (laughs) they're together I don't know they had two boys together and I don't know were they married no I don't know if they were married see again that's the thing Sally had two boys so she had two boys before they got together yeah anyway he said not making it work with Sally Fields is the biggest regret of his life yeah but then when it was all in the press that he had AIDS. They asked Sally Field and she said, oh, I haven't seen him for ages. It wouldn't... It said something along the yeah. lines of it wouldn't surprise me. But There's always something going on with That's Bert. right. That's what she and said. And he said that really, really hurt him. Yeah. And I think later she sent him a letter to apologise and he was like, no, you should have phoned me or whatever. It's yeah. not a letter. Yeah. Not good. Anyway. Yeah. Well, she was probably... T- I try not to judge people too harshly at the advent of AIDS because everyone was terrified. And they were terrified, but they didn't have it. Yeah, I know. They <laughs> didn't bloody have it. Anyway. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. But Lots there are stories about God, everyone. He married this woman, oh, she Laurie, like who a nightmare. really looks like a, a person who... She went after him and it looks like one of those people who wants to get him, have a kid and get yeah. the money. Yeah. You can see them a mile off because they look like strippers. You know, where Sally Field doesn't. The ones that look like strippers are sometimes the ones who actually are the crafty ones who are going after the money. Not always. <laughs> How do you know there aren't strippers that look like Sally Field? You're right. Have I just made a terrible, terrible <laughs> assumption? But you look at her and then you look at I the know. actual loves of his life and you go, isn't that funny? That's the one that was the one who screwed him for money, though. Literally and metaphysically. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. 1982, best little whorehouse in Texas. He doesn't talk about Dolly a lot other than Not say he lot. had an amazing time. And he her. said they blew so much money because they <laughs> laughed so much. They wasted so much time. I think they're kind of the mirror image of each other, yes. actually. When you think about them. Intelligent the male... people with bimbo images. Yeah, and from the South. Yeah. And the humour and the good looks. And I say he's one of the good guys. Dolly Parton's one of the good guys, actually. Yeah, right. And they're both yeah. hilarious people. Yeah. Comedy's big. Bet they shag like rabbits. <laughs> Why, <am I> Dolly? <laughs> <laughs> Dolly's faithful to her husband. <laughs> anyway. So we've run out of time, but basically he had kind of a bit of a slump in his career and then he did Boogie Nights. He actually says, the chart of my career looks like a heart attack. The ups and downs of it all. But um, he survived. He did. The Boogie Nights, he was nominated for an Oscar. But he didn't win it. And I think it's really honest that he says he went home and was really depressed and annoyed and because he, he really thought he was going yeah, to yeah. Robin Williams won it when Robin Williams walked past him to accept the Oscar Burt Reynolds said that he saluted him but Robin Williams tells everybody that he flipped, flipped him the bird, bird. <laughs> yeah he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have done no, that he, wouldn't. he said he went home he went to a hotel he's depressed he wouldn't tell anyone where he was he went out to the phone and John Voigt, his best friend, was the only one who kept trying and he wouldn't even have him in. So he, John Voigt went to the hotel, borrowed a waiter's outfit, came in his room service, got into the room and Bert Reynolds wasn't even looking up, got on the bed and kissed him. Yeah. <laughs> they finally actually managed to get him out of his depression. <laughs> That's a good mate. Yeah, so that's a what really a good, good friendship. Mate. Yeah. 
And he lived a good long life. And he says at the end of this, because he is writing it as an older man, he's lost a lot of friends along the way. A lot of this is memorial tributes to a lot of people. At the end of the day, he says, nobody had more fun than I did. Great. It's nice. I hope I feel like that at the end of my life. I I think a lot of people had a lot more fun than I did. (laughs) Like Burt Reynolds, probably. (laughs) My last words will be, Burt Reynolds had more fun than I did. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. You could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. Okay, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. Okay, thank you very much.